Coming up in this episode of In Clear Focus. If you have a team of five marketers that are 10x marketers and you give these tools to them, they suddenly turn into 100x marketers. They're so capable at producing content at scale that would be impossible previously. You're listening to In Clear Focus, fresh perspectives on marketing and advertising produced weekly by Big Eye, a strategy led full service creative agency growing brands for clients globally. Hello, I'm your host, Adrian Tennant, Chief Strategy Officer. Thank you for joining us. Artificial intelligence is transforming commercial content creation, offering an array of tools to streamline production processes generate new creative assets from existing ones, and improve content accessibility. AI-powered tools already exist that can automate video editing and audio production tasks, personalize content for different audiences, enhance audio quality, generate lifelike actors and voiceovers, automatically transcribe and caption content, and generate new creative elements on demand. Today's guest is an expert in how AI can be used for video and audio content creation and repurposing. Cody Schneider is an accomplished marketing executive with over a decade of experience. He's driven growth for several companies, including Rupa Health, where he helped raise the company's valuation from $20 million to $110 million in just six months. With a deep understanding of marketing technology, and the creator economy. Today, Cody is the co-founder and CEO of Swell AI, an AI-powered content marketing platform. To discuss Swell AI's capabilities and how a new breed of AI tools is revolutionizing content workflows, enhancing creativity, and fostering more data-driven decision-making, I'm delighted that Cody is joining us today from Denver, Colorado. Cody, welcome to In Clear Focus. Thank you for having me. Super excited to be here and talk about all the stuff that we're seeing kind of on the front lines for AI content creation. Yeah, well, it's a lot. But let's start with your background. Can you share a bit about your journey in the marketing industry? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So my bullet point background, I started off in e-commerce, did a lot of work in the print on demand space, made a lot of money there, lost even more money, uh, and then somehow ended up at a B2B marketing agency where my role there was really doing digital strategy for large, like really traditional companies. So we specialized in building materials manufacturers. Fortune 500 companies, imagine anybody that like produced like windows or like wood paneling or shower bases, super unsexy. But what I really got to see there was how to do marketing when the purchasing decision time horizon is super long. So it's a very long scale kind of sales cycle. My boss there went to a Y Combinator. And so he had a lot of experience within all the strategies and tactics that they were using in the startup world. And so really got to download all that information from him and cut my teeth and get a lot of at-bats working in that agency space, which then led me to working at a company called Rupa Health. Uh, I joined as person six and my role there was really (laughs) honestly just zero to wanting their entire content arm. So what we ended up doing was taking Rupa from a $20 million valuation to $120 million valuation in about six months. We focused on building basically owned media channels so that we could have our own distribution and then taking all of that long form media, so podcasts, live classes, et cetera, and then turning that into clips and blog posts and you know newsletters, white papers, any other piece of content that we thought that our audience would be interested in, and then building out those processes to kind of run, run and operate that. So yeah, happy to double click down and dive deeper on any of those pieces, but that's the high level. Cody, what prompted you to create an AI powered content marketing platform? Yeah. So really what I was seeing were kind of three trends that were evolving. I saw the erosion of search and the erosion of how people were traditionally finding information related to you know how they're choosing companies to <laughs> buy from. And the bigger thing that I was really seeing was that when I was working at the agency, the biggest feedback we got from customers is that they knew more than the salesperson that they were talking to about the product that they were trying to buy. And like, when you just think about what that means, like that's wild, right? And so what we realized really quickly was that we needed to create these owned media channels as a way to cut through the noise. So at Rupa, we were marketing to practitioners, physicians, right? Historically, those are very hard people to get in front of because they have high purchasing power. Anybody that is more economically well-off 
typically is more competitive <laughs> to uh, capture their attention. And so we basically started from that belief. That was our thesis and worked our way backwards. We're like, what do they want to hear? Well, they want to hear other practitioners talk about their businesses, talk about the research that they're doing, et cetera, that insider knowledge or expert information. We're going to basically record those conversations and then put that out into the public in front of this entire audience. So that was one uh, component or piece of this. The other thing that we saw happening is that social was becoming this place where majority of people were, and, and we see this even more so in younger generations, that's where they're beginning their discovery phase. So historically, you might go to Google and I would, I would you know, <laughs> do some keyword searches to find something, but more and more we're seeing people start their journey on social. That's where they're beginning. Okay, I'm looking for a solution to XYZ. They go to Instagram, they go to LinkedIn, they go to uh, TikTok, et cetera. They use that as a search engine to get you know that awareness content. And then they might go deeper. Maybe they read a long form blog post, et cetera. So we were seeing that happen as well. And we realized really quickly we needed to create some type of content production engine that would allow for us on a weekly basis or biweekly basis to create this content that we could have and share across social on a daily basis. And so what we did is we did a you know <laughs> long form podcast on a weekly cadence. We would then chop that up into clips. All those clips get scheduled out to our social media platforms. And then suddenly you're covering all of your bases across all of the places that people are using to discover you as a brand in the company. And so that was the overarching trends that we were seeing. And what led us to doing this AI thing, I, at a point I was, it was like 25 people that were part of the content team, like including all of the freelancers and everybody else that was touching all of this and all of the writers that we had. And, you know, I, I was looking at this and just being like, this is a, huge headache to manage from an operation standpoint. Anybody that's done content marketing knows this when you're working even with a team of six people, it gets very complicated quickly. What we saw as the opportunity with all of this AI tooling that was starting to come to the forefront was this opportunity for us to basically take all of the heavy lifting that a lot of these people were doing previously and automate or augment our, our, our teams to be able to entirely automate those workflows. Who is the Swell AI platform really designed for? So we started out wedging into the market, focusing on podcasters. The reason for that was like, this was like a very specific need. I mean, I had some friends that were already using podcasts as a way to grow their businesses. So we're like, hey, we'll just <laughs> automate writing your show notes and blog posts for you about the episodes. The first version of the product was like a Google Drive folder. People uploaded MP3s to, we would download them locally, run the software, and then I would manually email them back the content we created for them. But that was where we initially started. Now we're starting to see more and more marketing teams sit on top of us. We just are starting to release this feature. It's just called text sources. But initially, we just were MP3 files. Then it was MP4. So we could also do video. You could basically create clips and then also write off of the transcripts of the episodes. And we had customers asking for the ability to also provide us just like a raw text file with like a bunch of unstructured data. And then basically build AI workflows on top of that to create the content outputs they were looking for. So say you were trying to write a LinkedIn post or even three different LinkedIn posts based off of this idea about identity management. You know, say you're a, a cybersecurity company, you could provide this raw text file and then pull out the insights from all of that source material. Then based off of those insights, write a LinkedIn post about each of them. And then change those LinkedIn posts so that they're in the tone, style, voice, and format and persona of the brand. And then save that as a template so that anytime I want to do that exact same process in the future, I just provide more raw materials and that output gets generated. And so what we've seen for these teams that are starting to use us for this specific type of content creation is like maybe they were writing you know, two articles a week and now they can write 20 articles a week because they can get that first draft done within you know two minutes. <laughs> All they have to do is basically provide that source information. And then their team becomes way more effective and also more consistent because they have this standardized brand voice that is you know helping them produce that content. So we're still really in the early stages, but the opportunity that I'm seeing for companies is if you have a team of five marketers that are 10x marketers and you give these tools to them, they suddenly turn into 100x marketers. They're so capable at producing content at scale that would be impossible previously. Mm. Well, as you know, I've used Swell AI to transcribe episodes of InClear Focus and analyze the content to find good audio clips. But without getting too technical, how does Swell handle these types of tasks? Cody, what's going on under the hood? 
Yeah. So there's two things that are happening. So on the transcription side, we basically built a model that does word by word transcription, but we chop up the entire episode so that it's happening in parallel. So like historically, if I wanted to get like a really accurate AI done transcript, however long the episode was, that's how long it would take to transcribe the episode. So for example, if it's 60 minutes long, you need 60 minutes of time to actually have like compute running. So what we built and what we do is we chop that up into like more bite-sized pieces We transcribe those in parallel and then stitch them all together. Once we have that transcript as the source, that source file is basically this walled garden that we can then tell the AI to write based off of. And so on the clip identification side, there's a couple things that are going on. So we're doing what we call entity identification. So entity identification is this linguistics idea that way smarter people than us figured out how to do with AI, but basically can find like an idea within a corpus of information. And so we first find this like idea within a corpus and segment that out. And then based off of that, we say, okay, what's the core insight from this idea? We list that core insight. Then we say, hey, find a hook that's related to this core insight. And then now let's find an insight (laughs) that's related to that core hook. So our key takeaway that's related to that core hook. With all this, it's still a work in progress. (laughs) But what we're attempting to do is basically take the process that a human was doing previously. Like what are the, you know, core ideas from this 45 minute episode? Okay, now let me find sections that encapsulate those core ideas. Like what's a 10 word hook that gets the user? And then what's a 30 second clip that then supports that 10 word hook? That's all we were doing previously. You know, if you were a person in that transcript scrounging around trying to find where the good like nuggets of content are, we're just trying to replace all that heavy lifting. So then they get the, kind of these final outputs and really what they turn into is a curator rather than like that grunt labor. And we see this as the biggest opportunity, especially for content marketing teams using these types of tools, you know, and, and I get this question asked all the time, like, how do you implement this or start this process? I think for a lot of companies, they're like, we have to reinvent events. It's like AI transformation. And they're talking about all of these like massive overhauls of their organizations. And I'm very adamant now more and more about pushing back on that and saying, hey, it's actually way better. Just like find 5% of your current process that you can automate away with AI, automate that away, and then bump that up to 10% and then to 15 and then to 30 and then to 60. And suddenly you've just automated 80% of your process, but you're not changing your entire company structure or workflow. We've just seen companies that have gone kind of like <laughs> far to that side of the spectrum and they just aren't successful in the implementation. So it's really focusing on what you're doing now. What can I automate with these tools? And then the, having my team just focus on those high touch things that humans are better at. Another of Swell AI's features is the ability to repurpose and serialize content. What types of assets can the platform automatically create from an audio or video file? Yeah. So basically anything that you can imagine that you could repurpose a transcript into, you can build a template for. So we do podcast show notes, newsletters, long form blog posts that are 2000 words long, keyword identification, like recaps of what were the actual key takeaways that the customer was asking for. We have some salespeople that sit on top of us. And we have coaches that use us to actually structure their courses where they'll just drop in a whole like two hour piece of content. And they say, hey, find you know five to 10 minute sections of this like long piece of content so I can chop it up. And what we're just starting to implement and what I'm actually really excited about is the ability to go and query against your entire back catalog. So this is where the actual magic and power will come from in the long term for organizations and companies. So traditionally, like maybe you had a digital asset management system, right? It's just this place where all of your stuff is stored, but you have no idea what's in there and you can never find anything. I don't know if like any of you have ever used this or you, I know I imagine you have Adrian where it's just like, it's the most cumbersome solution I've ever seen. And especially when you get into a corporate setting where you have thousands of people interacting with this. And so what we see is the opportunity here is imagine this like huge digital content library that you have. And your team can go and query against all of that internal documentation, find the relevant information, and then repurpose that into something that they're trying to create. So a great example of this is maybe you had some white papers that were written, or you had some internal process documents. So you could go query, find those, put that as a source document, and then say, hey, I want to write a LinkedIn post. Here's the title that I want you to write based off of. And here's the source documents I want you to pull from. And now I just repurpose this content for whatever it is I'm trying to accomplish. 
But when you scale that up, it gets really interesting, especially from a video standpoint. Like imagine you have 500 episodes that are all video and suddenly you see a trend start to happen on TikTok or YouTube shorts. And what we're seeing is the opportunity is like as these trends happen, we can tap into those APIs to see them and then pull that information in and then bubble up content to your forefront. So imagine like a dashboard that's almost like a Pinterest (laughs) where it's like, You're scrolling down through your own content and it's suggesting clips, it's suggesting content ideas for you based off of what's topical currently within the market and what you have within your library. And so it becomes this asset to the company in a way that it never was previously. Like your content library will be your differentiator. And we see that as being the path forward because it's become way easier to build products, like good products than it ever has been. And also to do like distribution. So the only way that you're going to be able to differentiate is if you have this library of content that only you have access to, that's like these industry experts or whatever that is, that thing, that data, that information that only you have. And so this is how we're seeing it start like, you know, it's still early days with all this, but this is how we're seeing this start to play out. Let's take a short break. We'll be right back after this message. Hello, I am Dr. Anastasia Karkne Gabriel, the author of Cultural Intelligence for Marketers, Building an Inclusive Marketing Strategy. My book provides a practical four-step approach to enhancing cultural fluency, maximizing social impact, and embedding critical thinking in your marketing process. I break down key concepts, explain how to use advanced cultural insights in marketing and advertising, and feature case studies from brands, including Microsoft and REI. As an Inclear Focus listener, you can save 25% on Cultural Intelligence for Marketers when you order directly from the publisher at koganpage.com. Enter the exclusive promo code BIGI25 at checkout. Shipping is complimentary for customers in the US and the UK. I hope my book helps you build inclusive, culturally intelligent marketing strategies. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm talking with Cody Schneider, co-founder and CEO of Swell AI a platform that assists podcast producers, agencies, and networks in creating written content from audio or video recordings. In Clear Focus has over 220 episodes at this point. I've been very fortunate. We've spoken to some amazing people. And a really interesting use case could be how a book might be created from these interviews. So taking that use case for Swell AI as book creation, can you describe what that process might look like from, and I'm going to use air quotes, the author's perspective? Totally. We're actually having somebody do this currently with a show. It's about 150 episodes. So they're doing like micro chapters. He's consolidated some of the episodes into like categories. And then they're, I think it's going to be in total, the book will be like 20 chapters. But basically what he uploads into Swell, this is section one of the book that it writes. We do that for each of them. And then he's combining it in post. But the way that he's doing this is he's basically built a template that has his tone, style, and voice in the way that he wants to write. And it has the understanding of the outline of the entire book that it's going to write. So there's some cohesiveness in the parts that it's creating that he'll then add together later. So his view, you know, the goal for him is he's like, hey, if I can get my first draft off to my publisher so that I can get my advance, (laughs) that's a win, right? And so that's how we're seeing kind of the phase one of this implementation. And what's interesting is that like, this is not a change from how people have written books in the past, right? It's the exact same process. So if you look at like how to win friends and influence people, how did they write that book? You know, it's like one of the best selling business books of all times. Well, they went out and they hired five journalists and those five journalists interviewed 300 people over the span of about a year and a half. And then they went through all of that information. They found the trends, they built an outline, they wrote the book, and then they came back to the publisher and they're like, okay, cool. What are the changes we need to make, et cetera. And then also layering on those human elements. We're taking that same idea, but just basically automating that first process. But where we see this going is you could hypothetically have an entire back catalog of content, say, you know, it's 300 episodes. And with these token limits, as they get larger and larger, you'll be able to put that entire back catalog of content within to a single source document. And then you'll be able to query against that source document and say, hey, I'm writing a book with this title. Here's a short description. Write me a book outline, a chapter outline based off of the source information that I just provided you and this title that I suggested to you. It writes the outline. You can then modify the outline to the changes you want to make. And then you can go and say, okay, now write 
the entire book based off of this outline and the source information I just provided to you. And you've just got your first draft of the book. Now that's like a very high level version of this. There's a bunch more nuance that probably is a part of that of like, how do I get it to sound like me? How do I fine tune it so that it feels on brand, et cetera. But you know, when you think about what this basically is signaling what is going to happen, you're going to see an, an abundance of content basically come into them. And we're already seeing this, especially in the digital form. If you look at AI written content specifically for SEO, it's basically taken over all of the search results. That's why Google just did this most recent content quality policy update. And while we saw hundreds of sites just went to zero basically overnight and Reddit and Quora and <laughs> all of these forum sites that are user generated content they are the ones that basically saw the benefit from this because Google doesn't know how to combat this AI spam in the way that they've seen. Cody, you posted on LinkedIn recently suggesting that businesses need to become media companies to reach customers effectively, especially with the potential decline of traditional search and the rise of generative AI. Why do you believe social media will become the primary channel for customer discovery and learning? And how can businesses adapt their strategies to capitalize on this shift? So I think the overarching thing that I'm seeing occur is that there's a distrust for content that doesn't have a face to it. And it kind of makes sense when you look at the social components of that, right? Like traditionally, if I give you bad information and it's like me talking to you, you'll be like, that's not a trustworthy source, right? There's repercussions for me providing the incorrect information. If you go and you Google something right now, tell me the last time you remember, you know, an author from one of the articles that you read. I would guarantee majority of people don't remember that. In contrast, when you look at social and when you start your search there, and again, you're seeing young people do this more in particular, but if they want to find a local bar and you always see it in consumer and then it bubbles up into B2B, Right. But in consumer, if they want to find like a local bar or restaurant, they're starting there because they go and they find John's random TikTok. And John is talking about some vinyl bar that's in his neighborhood. And he loves this vinyl bar. He thinks it's cool. If those people that saw that short clip go to that vinyl bar and it's a terrible experience, they're going to be like, okay, John is a bad source of information. We don't trust him anymore. And there's a repercussion for like the incentives are appropriately aligned with that. In contrast to when you look at the incentives that are, you know, traditional search, it's differently, like it's not aligned. Like there's no repercussions for the website if it's like bad information. The website, all they care about most of the times is just getting a sign up to occur. And again, we still do programmatic SEO. That's one of our marketing strategies. So I don't think that this is like something you just totally throw to the side. I think it's just shifting more of resources over to the social component because it's just naturally where people are starting to begin. It really just <laughs> how they make their purchasing decisions. And it makes sense, right? Like if I have a podcast and I publish it on a weekly basis, say my target, I'm actually doing some consulting right now and we're doing this for a company, but say my, my ICP is interior designers and I'm going to sell them the software. And so if I have a podcast where every week <laughs> they get emailed an episode and they listen to me interview an interior designer about their career, their business, everything that they're doing, the things that they're seeing, the mistakes that they made, et cetera, and they tell these stories, if me as a founder is the host of that show, there's going to be so much trust that's built into that audience. And we see this in the data, right? We're seeing that like the open rates and the response rates on cold emails are increasing when you put people on in like an email list that's distributing content to them before. And it makes sense. Like there, it's a warm lead. They've already interacted with your brand. So when you know, Trevor reaches out to you and he's a BDR, you're way more receptive to that initial conversation with somebody like that. And so I'm using podcasting there as the example, but when we talk about social, social is that point of, it's where people are starting that discovery of information. They will probably go deeper, but that is where we're seeing the shift occur in younger generations. And again, where do things start? Like where did Facebook begin? Colleges. And now it's like <laughs> my grandma spends all day long on it. It works its way up typically the age ladder of the demographics of society. So that if we're seeing the younger generation start their searches there, we're going to see this flowing over into the older demographic groups within our audiences. In your LinkedIn post, you also outlined a content creation and distribution strategy that involves conducting expert interviews, repurposing content across multiple formats and platforms, and leveraging AI tools to streamline the process. 
Cody, are there any companies or brands that you see successfully implementing this approach right now? Yeah, I think the biggest one that nobody talks about this is comedians, just as an overarching group. So they're doing an unbelievable job at this. They basically sit down and they have conversations with people and they be funny (laughs) and they record these episodes and they chop those up into clips and then they distribute those across all these different channels. One that probably is in the B2B space that people will know or at least touched or interacted with is Refine Labs and everything that Chris Walker is doing. He's been doing this for 10 years, (laughs) but basically his whole process is he does a podcast weekly for two different shows. One's an interview and one is just him deep diving into a concept. They take that and they chop it up into clips and they distribute it across social and his entire agency and really the new software that he's building that's like a Salesforce integration from my understanding is built on top of that. So I think that it's just so blue ocean still, like in all honesty, like I talk about this, you know, I mean, we only stumbled on this as a process like three years ago in 2020. People were doing that way before us. But now for the first time, you can actually scale this up with these tools. And I think that's why this you know, turning point moment is happening. The other thing I just want to piggyback off of this is the value that's created in this. Like if I'm a CEO and I am having conversations <laughs> like in public with other industry experts within my space. So I, I do some work with a company that's in the biotech space as an example. So we built this email list for them that is like all the biotech founders in the U.S., And we basically got them to listen to the podcast. Like we started doing this for them about 12 months ago, got them to listen to the podcast. And at this point now, like they have basically everybody in the industry listening to the show on a weekly basis. What has come from that is they're now getting inbound from investors for the portfolio companies that they invested in. They're getting warm intros because they want those founders to come on the show, like the biotech podcast show. And so they're now getting inbound of their ICP. These are people that they couldn't get in front of. There's no way with a cold email previously, but now they're getting introductions to them. And then the other byproduct is, is they have so much leverage within their community, even though they're a small company that's only 20 people, they can now go and negotiate with these larger organizations, whether it be Roche or Genentech, et cetera. And they have this piece of media that they can use as this leverage point that they never could previously. I get asked this often, who's been doing this the longest? And there's two companies I always point at. Aero Electronics, $6 billion market cap company. Nobody talks about it. All they do is resell like components for electronics. They are the king of content marketing. If you want to look how to do this as a company, and it makes sense, right? Like they're selling a commodity. How do you create differentiation if you're selling a commodity? You have to create content. And then the other one that's done this unbelievably, that's more consumer is Red Bull. Like they're selling sugar water, right? <laughs> let's, let's be real. But when you think about them, where they sit in the mind of people, it's one of the coolest brands that's ever existed. The only reason that has occurred is because they've invested so heavily in this content marketing. And for them, they sponsor the Red Bull F1, right? Like series and that team. That is content marketing. Like everything that revolves around that is content marketing. And that just adds value and creates inbound for the brand. The thing that happens from that too, though, often is that when you make this owned media arm of your company, there's two things that come from it. It gives you that leverage, but you also get, it's, and this is the craziest thing to me, it turns your marketing department from a cost center into a profit center. So Red Bull, their media house actually makes more money than its product sales that they do. And when you look at Aero Electronics, it's pretty close on that as well. But a, an example from like my own career that I can give is when we were at Rupa, we made a, you know, a top 20 medical podcast in about six months. We're getting about 150,000 downloads a month. Like when I ended up leaving, they're doing way more than that now. But they went and they sold ad space to Athletic Greens. And they suddenly just paid the entire salary of their whole growth department for every team member that was there with that deal. So, you know, you basically just became net on the cost that traditionally marketing was doing. And what does that mean for an organization when you have all of these own distributors? So these are all the things that packaged together is the opportunity that exists when you build these content engines. And again, I'm just trying to build this platform where it's like, you can have a team of five people that are excellent sit on top of, and they produce enough content that it feels like you have a team of a hundred content producers working on your marketing. Makes sense. Cody, what's next for Swell AI? Are there any features on the product roadmap that you're allowed to talk about? Yeah. So we got two things I'm really excited about, and this is based off of the feedback we've gotten from customers. So 
we started to generate clips. We just added auto cropping and we're about to redo our caption templates uh, so that you can have them be more on brand and do like overlays, et cetera. So from there, the next thing that people have asked for, or like, what do you do with clips? You pull them out and you go to your social media scheduler and you schedule them. So we're building that into Swell as well. We're going to start with YouTube Shorts and then expand from there. But basically, you'll be able to send the clips directly from the application right to the scheduling section of the app. And then with that connection, what that allows for us to do is then pull in data from your social channels so that we can then bubble up insights from that. And this is more of a long-term thing. I see this on the horizon a year or so, but this will allow for us to basically make it so that you have all of this content you're producing. It's getting scheduled and posted. We can look at best performers, go back to your library of content, and then find more content like the best performers and suggest that to you to put onto your socials. And then the other thing that people have asked for is, again, this stuff is super simple, but it's like SMS and email management. So we have a lot of podcasters. This is one of the ways that they see that they can get downloads to occur effectively. Like we're writing their email copy. It's like they're taking that and <laughs> putting it into whatever ESP that they're using. But we see this as a path forward to be able to basically have this single place where all of my source content it exists. I can repurpose that into any form that I want. I can get it onto the platforms that I'm trying to market on. I can then analyze that data in the same place. And when we look at what good content companies are doing and really just what good marketing is doing anymore that's data-driven, what do they do? They test things, <laughs> they see what works, they do less of what doesn't work and they do more of what does and then they get more efficient in everything that they're doing. And we're just trying to build the platform to do that for these content teams as we see content marketing becoming this more important vehicle for companies to survive. If in Clear Focus listeners would like to learn more about the Swell AI platform, what's the best way to do so? Yeah. So I'm very active on Twitter and LinkedIn. You can reach out in both of those places. You can go to swellai.com to sign up for free and also schedule a demo with me. We're still a super small team. So you're talking to <laughs> the founders and you know it's tight knit. And then, yeah, you can also just Google my name, Cody Schneider. If I don't come up, uh, I'm really bad at my job, so I should be there. But yeah, those are the places that I'm the most accessible. Excellent. Cody, thank you very much for being our guest on In Clear Focus. Thank you for having me. It was great to be here. Love talking about this today. Thanks again to my guest this week, Cody Schneider, co-founder and CEO of Swell AI. As always, you'll find a full transcript of our conversation and links to the resources we discussed on the Big Eye website at bigeyeagency.com. Just select Insights from the menu. Thank you for listening to In Clear Focus, produced by Big Eye. I've been your host, Adrian Tennant. Until next week, goodbye.